Welcome everyone, the 12 days of OTRS Central Christmas continues. Your first time checking out this channel, you sh certainly should smash that subscribe button, click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified of future videos that come from this channel. There's plenty of other great content to come in this video series and certainly in 2021. I wonder whatever he could mean. But today's topic should certainly have a lot of you feeling humbug because it will certainly evoke some strong emotions, as it should. Because today I'm going to talk about nine black wrestlers who should have been world champion. And a couple of key notes here. There are certainly more than nine that I could have put on this list, but I'm staying within the parameters of the video series, so I'm focusing on nine. It doesn't even mean that these are necessarily the nine most egregious. Like you could have said somebody like a Bearcat Wright or Sweet Daddy Seeky. You know, I could go on and on and on. The natural Butch Reed also did not make this list, although it certainly was a strong case I could have made that he should have. Um, this is just nine guys that I felt like at some point in time in their careers, black men that should have been world champions somewhere. And now this is not just a should have been WWE champion list. This is world champion of any major promotion, any major recognized North American world championship. So that's NWA, WWF slash WWF slash WWE, WCW, TNA. I'll even throw ROH into the mix. Um, but I won't throw like New Japan into the mix. Um, so if somebody like, you're going to say, well, Booker T was never WWE champion, or Mark Henry was never WWE champion, but well, they were still world heavyweight champion. And we, I know I've talked about before how that's a secondary title. Get all that. But that's not the premise here. They were at least world champions somewhere. Booker T was also multiple time, five time, five time, five time, five time, five time WCW champion. I'm talking about nine black wrestlers that, for all intents and purposes, never held a major world title at any point in time in their career. I certainly want to hear from you in the comments like how you would have rated this list, but I'm ready. Let's go ahead and get into it. The nine black wrestlers who should have been world champions somewhere at some time in their careers, and they weren't. Well, yeah, MVP makes the list because even though I know he is currently active, the fact that you look back throughout his career catalog well over a decade, and he's never held a major world championship, to my recollection, whether it be in WWE or even in TNA or anywhere else, was stunning to me. Like, this is a guy that the WWE really was pushing for a long period of time. And as much as anything else, this is just a comparison sake of, you look at some of the bums and busters that have been world champion, MVP is at least up to that level of standard, if not higher. And when you look at the current business he's doing with the Hurt business, if you were ever going to put the world championship on him, this certainly could have been potentially and arguably a time to do that, and you could have made it work. But I'm just surprised that a guy like him, guy that you know looked like a star to a certain degree and could talk, be a personality, has never been world champion anywhere. That's just stupidly stunning to me. Ahmed Johnson had some challenges with injuries and attitude and so forth. But when you look at this dude back in the mid-90s, you were looking at him and you're saying, that's got to be a future world champion. Because there was an intimidating opposing presence about him. He certainly had the look. Like, Ahmed Johnson was cool as shit. And it was just tragic and sad that I felt like he never really achieved his full potential, which... Partly was on him, I will agree. But a lot of that had to do with WWE and Vince McMahon, WWF at the time, in my humble opinion. This was a guy that could have went farther than that he actually did. And I certainly believe during that time in the mid-90s, at some point in time, you could have found an opportunity to make him the world champion, at least for a little bit, if you really wanted to. Yeah, Abdullah the Butcher absolutely belongs on this list. You know, you could talk about the spreading of herpes and so forth. I'll talk about that in the next video of this 12 Days of OTR Central Christmas series. But when you look at Abdullah the Butcher, this was a guy that was a big star that drew money in Japan and throughout the different territories. You go to Detroit, you go wherever. Like, this was a guy that drew a lot of money for a lot of years. At some point in time, you would have thought that some major company, maybe your territory, major promotion, maybe the NWA, 
would have made him a traveling heel world champion, and it would have worked even if for a short period of time just to put over another baby face. Now, maybe this is an example of the character was so strong and he had more flexibility not being the world champion somewhere where he could travel and always keep his shtick and gimmick fresh for decades. There's certainly an argument to be made, but at some point in time, somehow, somewhere, I always felt it was a mistake that Abdullah the Butcher at no point in time was ever truly given the chance to be world champion of a major company because based off of his track record, his history, his ability to draw money, he should have. already hear it now, number six on the list, Shelton Benjamin, well, he can't talk. How many of these asshats that you root for in these different companies that have actually been world champions can't talk a lick to save their damn lives, can't be personalities to save their damn lives? There is absolutely, and let me repeat and emphasize this, absolutely no reason, any defensible justification, none of that, as to why Shelton Benjamin was never made world champion. Whether that be with WWE or hell, wasn't he in ROH for a long period of time? Like, they give a shit about personalities being able to talk on the mic. Like, this to me is a glaring, gaping void and omission. Somebody that should have gotten it because the fans certainly would have gotten behind it, even if it was for a short period of time. You have seen far worse world champions, I promise you. And when you compare them to some of the other guys, there's absolutely no reason that I could think of other than Pigment, that Shelton Benjamin was never a major world champion anywhere. You think of JYD, you think about just how big of a star he was in the 1980s. This is like such an egregious one, you could say in theory. So why isn't he higher on the list? I think part of it is circumstance and situation. Like, as he got into the mid-80s and he came to WWF and he was starting to battle the problems with drugs really heavy and he started putting on weight, it was also at a time where it was all about Hogan. Like, are you really going to make JYD the champ over Hogan? Like, you know, there, there's there's reasons why he was never the champion. You can make a different argument about how the hell did JYD never hold any title in WWF. That's a different conversation for sure. But when you talk about a man who could move the people and you could talk about a man that was box office that could draw money in his prime and his peak. There were few bigger and better than JYD. Sylvester Reuter absolutely was a star and a massive star, especially in the Mid-South Territory. There's no excuse to me in the 80s at that point in time that he couldn't have even gotten a short run as a babyface, as the top guy, as a world champ. That's when I think of that period between 80 to 84, somewhere along the way, there should have been an excuse or justification made to put the belt on him instead of just yet another pasty face. But that's what the NWA used to do. That's the type of garbage that organization was. JYD absolutely should have been a world champion. And the fact that he ever, never was, was a crock. And the only reason he's not higher on this list is because by the time he got to the mid-80s again, you weren't going to make him the champ over Hogan. And he wasn't quite the same. So I just think there are other guys... Part of this list is about the situation, the circumstances, and the timing as to making them world champions. But JYD absolutely belongs on this list. The keys in the South in the 1970s and 1980s was making the white women swoon. And few could do that more than Tony Atlas. My goodness, like when you think about white meat baby faces, to spin a phrase here, Tony Atlas was it. You know, he had the look that wrestling loved at the time, other than his skin pigment, obviously. But he was a big, strong power lifter. But he also had the personality that was kind of reserved and humble and sweet. Like, when I look at a guy like Tony Atlas, I say, at some point in time, again, I go back to the NWA belt. And I say, you're telling me at some point in time, you couldn't have found a way to throw the strap on Tony Atlas even for a short period of time. And I would even say the WWF, when they had brought him in in the early 80s, you're telling me that you couldn't have made him the world champion at some point in time before you decided to really run with Hogan? You could have done something with him. Like, you know, it would have also been fun, admittedly, to see Tony Atlas be a world champ, turn heel, and talk about how he wants the white women everywhere to step on his face. Yeah! You do you, Tony! But... He had a name. He was a star. And when you look at the physique and look at all the other shit, like, 
Tony Atlas absolutely should have been a world champion somewhere at some point in time of a major promotion, and he never was, and that's a crock of shit. For decades, the big cat Ernie Ladd was a major box office attraction for promotions all throughout the country, and frankly, all throughout the world. And when you talk about this former AFL football star who made this successful transition to professional wrestling, you're talking about a big imposing presence, six foot nine, three hundred pounds. Like Ernie Cat was the the Ernie Lad, the big cat was a real deal dude. He was absolutely believable, absolutely legit, drew money all around the world. And you're telling me again, and I keep coming back to it because of the timing. The WWWF, the NWA. Those a-holes couldn't figure out a way to make the big cat Ernie Ladd a world champion at some point in time? Really? What possible reason or justification could you have? This was a guy who was recognizable from his days as a football player. Big star for decades in wrestling. Like, you could have sent him to territories as your world champion as a heel, and the old Poland and Ernie Ladd have him walk out and take the count-out loss. Man, you could have built up to a big cage match that would have really helped put over a new babyface top star in a big, big way. But the politics and the racism of the time, in, in no small part, certainly prevented it from happening. But when you look at some of the biggest black wrestling superstars of all time, Ernie Cad, or er, Ernie Ladd, Jesus Christ, the big cat Ernie Ladd, sorry, certainly is at the top of that list. And that's why he's number three on my list of black wrestlers who should have been world champion. Because it's a damn crying shame that he never was. There are certainly some bigger names that appear earlier on this list, I will grant you. But part of this is about situation and timing. And I haven't included some guys like maybe a Big E, etc. Because they're still kind of in the peak of their career. There's still time for that to play out. I'm looking at guys that have had most of their career play out or their careers are done. And when you look at the alpha male, Monty Brown, and you go back to that mid-2000s time frame in TNA history, instead of worrying about protecting the fragile ego of Defender, the Memphis mid-card piece of crap who drew no dimes, even though he broke 10,000 guitars, still to this day, a decade and a half later, you have many fans like myself that are still agitated and pissed off to no end that of all the bums that have been world champions for TNA and different promotions throughout the years, that somehow, someway, we courageously found a way to never make the alpha male, Monty Brown, a world champion. And it would have been such a big deal for TNA at the time. It would have helped them significantly. But we couldn't fucking have that, could we? We just can't have nice things. We can't have the pouts reign supreme. We can't have the alpha male of the Serengeti be a top guy, can we? You're afraid he was going to be too big of a star? A bigger star than the founder? When I think about the ones that piss me off the most, this is it. And when you think about the timing, the circumstance, the company, the performer, the level of competition around him, there is absolutely no possible reason, excuse, or justification for why the hell Monty Brown was a TNA World Champion at some fucking point in time. Except one. talk about historically important and significant figures in the career or in the span of professional wrestling history, Bobo Brazil is at or near the top of that list. This is a man who was a huge star for decades in his different territories that he worked all around the country, all around the world. And what makes this omission so incredibly egregious is that there was technically a point in time in the early 60s, like you're talking about the peak of the fight against segregation, Jim Crow laws, and everything else. There was even a brief moment in time where they involved Bobo Brazil in an NWA title change sequence that technically made him the champion, but then it didn't, and we never really recognized it or count it. Like, when you think about Bobo Brazil, he was a charismatic dude, 
He was somebody that could appeal to fans, black and white alike. He was a guy that had personality. He could talk. You could feel the conviction of the seriousness of him. And when I look back at history and where he had been and how big of a star he was and the money that he drew and everything else, he could have been one of those socially important and relevant figures in the sporting and entertainment pop culture landscape at a time that the world in this country specifically really needed it. And we were deprived of that. So you can certainly make your arguments to me of who's the biggest glaring omission, who's the one that should have been. But to me, when I think about black wrestlers who got robbed because of racism and other factors as well, that should have been world champion of a major territory organization promotion and never were. Number one, number one on my list, absolutely positively, has to be Bobo Brazil. For some of the people on this list, racism is the reason they were never world champion. For others, it's not quite as simple. You know, not everything is as black and white as this world likes to make it. There are other circumstances, other factors at play. I talked about it with guys like Ahmed Johnson, talked about it with guys like JYD. You know, but when you look at some of the vanilla faces, the pasty faces over the years that have been world champions, you sit there and you wonder, like, what's so different between them and some other guys? It makes you think a little bit. But nonetheless, call me a cuck in the comments all you want. I've been called it my whole life. What the hell difference does it matter now? But there you have it, my list. Of the nine black wrestlers who should have been world champions somewhere in some time for a major company or promotion and never were. You are, as always, welcome to flame away with your flaming keyboard fingers of fire in the comment section. And Lord only knows, I can't wait to see the comments on this video. Uh, but make sure, again, you smash that subscribe button. Let me know what you thought of this video. Let me know what you're thinking about this 12 Days of OTR Essential Christmas video series as a whole. The next video, the eighth day of OTR Essential Christmas, is going to be about the eight guys who hung around too damn long. We're going to bash some big names and legends that held on for way too long. And you're going to see a lot of familiar faces and names there. And I imagine a lot of you are probably going to agree with it. So join that bash party. Make sure you do.